I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. And I'm still thinking about that wonderful time we had last week talking to Kathy Beaumont, the girl who's the voice of Alice in Walt Disney's movie of Alice in Wonderland. Oh, you love that, did you? Yes, I should say so. And I've been saving every one of the pictures of Alice in Wonderland from the comics, and I read them over and over again. And I'm so anxious to see what's going to happen today when she eats the cookie. Well, that's wasted any time, then. All right, let's not waste any time. Please hurry and read the funny. Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page one of the first section, up along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. After his fight with Black John at the old stockade, Hoppy had sent Ken back to the telegraph camp with the news that the mountaineers had agreed to let the workmen continue with their job of putting through the telegraph line. Hoppy had gone into Black John's quarters for a talk with Black John. Today, he wakes up in a dungeon, his head aching. Hoppy looks around the dungeon, first picture, and he sees an old man with a white beard and hair sitting in front of him. Hoppy exclaims, Why, Rocky Ridges, how did you get here? Rocky Ridges replies, Oh, I've been here for weeks, Hoppy. You're the newcomer. Black John kicked you into this dungeon. Last picture, top row, Hoppy says, Why, he said you'd left these parts. I remember following him into his quarters to talk it over. Why, someone must have slugged me. Rocky says, Oh, yeah, that would be Glintai. First picture, next row, Rocky goes on. He and Black John locked me in here for agreeing to let a new telegraph line cross our land. Hoppy answers, So that's why I never heard from you. Hoppy begins to look around the walls of the dungeon, saying, They're up to something, Rocky. We gotta force our way out of here. Rocky shakes his head, saying to him, No, no, don't waste your time, Hoppy. This dungeon's old, but escape-proof. I've gone over every inch of it a dozen times. There's no way out, excepting through that upper door. And it's locked from the outside. Meanwhile, last picture, middle row, Black John and Glintye are sitting beside one of the cannon at the old fort. Black John is saying, This cannon was mounted here by the military. So as to command that pass, in case of attack. Glintai replies, Yeah, and it's a natural route that telegraph crowd will use in stringing their wire through here. Yeah, I'm beginning to see why you gave them the go-ahead sign, Black John. First picture, bottom row, Black John picking up a keg of powder says, Yeah, we'll load the cannon and post a watch for him. As soon as that outfit moves up within range, we'll be ready for him. <laughs> Meanwhile, the nearby hills echo to the sounds of hammer and saw as the telegraph line slowly advances through the virgin wilderness. Last picture, Ken looks at the line of telegraph poles going up swiftly and says cheerfully, Hey, at this rate, we'll soon be through the pass. Hoppy's pal, California, nods his head and says, Yeah, too bad Hoppy ain't here to see this. And what's keeping him anyway? he gets really worried because if he gets worried enough, then maybe he'll go looking for Hoppy. Yes, if only he'd suspect that something is wrong because Hoppy hasn't shown up, he might get a searching party out. I wish he would because Hoppy certainly needs some help. I don't know how he can ever get out of that dungeon. Oh, if someone does, doesn't do some scouting around, they'll never discover the trick that Black John is up to. And I know what you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me that I'll have to wait till next week to find out. I'm sorry, but that's true. 
But now we might just as well continue with Prince Valiant. Oh, yes, please. Very well, then. Let's go over the page. There he is on page three. And you remember last week that Prince Valiant and his friends Sir Gawain and young Arthur were on their way to Val's home? Yes, and when they came to a river which they have to cross, they saw two knights blocking their way. Do you think they'll be fighting? Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant to the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince Valiant has been ordered back to Thule and is riding to Sir Gawain's home in Orkney to take ship. At Harley's Ford, two armed and mounted knights bar the way. Second picture, Gawain says, well, My hurt shoulder will not permit me to bear a shield. Val replies, Oh, and with my strained arm, I can barely lift a lance, so... Last picture, top row, without a word, the true strange knights sent lance and shield in charge. Val has but time to whisper a plan of attack. At the very moment of contact, Gawain swerves aside from his opponent, first picture, next row. And both he and Val throw their weight upon Val's adversary. He topples from his horse. Quickly, they wheel around and ride at the other enemy knight. Val's solid shield and Gawain's strong lance again work together. And the other knight is thrown from his horse. All right, now, ride for the river. Quick, hurry! First picture, bottom row. They reach the river. And as they ride across, Gawain looks back at the two knights, slowly getting to their feet. And Gawain accuses Val. Very unknightly tactics, Val. Why do you pick up these scurvy tricks? And Val answers with a smile. By keeping bad company. Second picture. Bottom row. In fair weather and foul, they travel the length of Britain. And their injuries have healed ere they reach Hadrian's Wall. The huge stone wall that was built by the Romans to keep the enemy out. Beyond is the land of the warlike Picts, which they must cross before reaching Scotland and the Orkneys. They are damp and cold from their ride in the rain, so here they rest in one of the old Roman mild castles, last picture, making plans around a cozy fire for the continuation of their journey the next day. Because once Prince Valiant had to go through there, and you remember he had terrible battles with those Picts, those Picts that were very wild, savage-looking little men. That's right. You remember very well. Yes, I do, do I? You do. Thank you. Do you think that Val will have that kind of trouble this time? Well, you never can tell. We'll find that out next week. Now let's turn over the page, and there on top of page five is Flash Gordon. Shall we read him? Oh, yes, please. Because remember last week, Flash captured Toxo, the leader of the Martians. Yes, and then Dr. Ruff was worried because the oxygen, which is in the air they breathe, is running short. And if they don't get oxygen, they will die. Well, let's read right now and find out what they do. So here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. While Flash and his co-workers were busy fighting the Martians, they failed to notice that their space platform was running short of oxygen. A hurried SOS to the Earth by radar phone gets no answer. Atmospheric disturbances prevent the signals from getting through. Meanwhile, Toxo, the captured pirate, gulps the waning air greedily. Although as a Martian he can live without breathing the air, he enjoys the luxurious feel of air in his lungs, and he gloats over the fact that he is consuming precious oxygen his human enemies need to live. Flash picture top row, Flash orders his companions. Lie still. You've got to make the air last till rescue arrives. While Flash continues his frantic efforts to reach the earth with his calls for oxygen, Toxo manages to wiggle free from his bonds and creep toward the hatchway of the cabin. First picture bottom row, jamming the safety controls, the evil genius from Mars opens both inner and outer airlock doors, and the ship's air supply hisses swiftly out into empty space. The rocket cabin will soon be a vacuum. The damage done, Toxo escapes in the maze of corridors on the space platform. Gasping for breath, Flash hurls himself against the airlock, last picture, while Dale and the others scramble to down their space helmets. With his last ounce of strength, Flash swings shut the ponderous lock. Oh, why didn't somebody keep their eye on that little man? Yes, now there's real danger again, and just when it looked as though everything was going to be all right. Yes, Flash really is in trouble, because if that message doesn't go through to Earth in time, they could all die. Yes, now Toxo, the leader of the Martians, is free again, too. Well, maybe next week Flash will do something that'll save this terrible situation. My, I hope so. Yes. Now I do believe it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, yes, and I have 
have them right here on the first page of the second section. Very well, then. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood's neighbor, Mr. Nuttles, has come over to Dagwood's place and complains, Bumstead, your dogs chased our cat up on our roof. Dagwood replies, Tush, 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 tush. Don't get so upset about it, Mr. Nuttles. He picks up a ladder standing nearby and goes over to Nuttles' place, saying, These things happen occasionally. Relax, old boy. I'll rescue your cat for you. Dagwood goes to Nuttles' backyard. Last picture, top row. He gets the ladder tangled up in Mrs. Nuttles' laundry, hanging on the line. Mrs. Nuttles yells, You're ruining my wash! First picture next row, Dagwood sets up the ladder and starts to climb up to the roof. Mrs. Nuttles sees the ladder standing in her flower bed and exclaims, And look, he's ruining my begonia bed. Mr. Nuttles, who is jotting all these things down on a piece of paper, tells her, Don't worry, dear, I'm making a list of all the damage he's done. In a moment, Dagwood is on top of the roof. Next picture, trying to coax the cat to come off the roof. Come, kitty. Nice, kitty. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come, kitty. Come to Dagwood. The cat spits at him. And then suddenly makes a leap at Dagwood. Last picture, second row. Ah! And scratches Dagwood on the head. Hey, help, help. Get off me, will you? <laughs> Dagwood struggles to get free. The ladder falls over backward. Ah! Dagwood struggles. He falls off the ladder through a window. First picture, third row. Into a cake, Mrs. Nuttles is baked. Oh, my cake. <laughs> Dagwood picks himself up, all covered with bruises and scratches. Mr. Nuttles hands him a sheet of paper listing the damage he's done. Middle picture, third row, Dagwood says, Okay, okay, I'll pay for everything. Just keep that wild beast away from me. Last picture, third row, Dagwood's at home, surrounded by his dogs and telling Blondie, Nuttles is an unreasonable old crank, kicking up all that fuss over nothing. He goes on first picture, bottom row. He claims our dogs chased his cat up... And he's interrupted by Nuttles' cat, who goes dashing after his dogs, who run away in fear. A moment later, Dagwood is at Nuttles' house. He knocks on the door. The door opens. Dagwood hollers, Nuttles, your cat chased my dogs up on our roof. Last picture, Nuttles looks up on top of the Bumstead's house and sees Dagwood's five puppies sitting on the roof, looking as angry as a March hare in November. Dagwood shouts, It's a shame! Outrage. Nuttle says timidly, Okay, okay, where's the ladder? And the dogs snarl. Oh, now Dagwood will have a chance to get his money back because I'll bet you that Mr. Nuttle will break things getting Dagwood's dogs down, too. Well, I hope so, after all the trouble Dagwood got into. Yes, I hope so, after all the trouble Dagwood got into. Yes. Well, look, there's Roy Rogers underneath Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, Roy Rogers. Read that, please. I will in just a minute, but first here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A yip yo Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip yo <laughs> Roy has been captured by the outlaws and has discovered that the banker Michaels, who he thought was his friend, is their leader. Roy is now being taken by Michaels and his henchmen back to Flat Top Butte, where the gold dust has been hidden on the top of the steep rock. When they arrive at the rock, they find that Roy's friend, Cube Root, is on top of the rock with the gold, and that Beetle, the outlaw left behind to guard it, is now down on the ground. Michaels says, Jut, untie Roger's hands, but don't show yourselves. We'll use Roger's to get Root to lower the strong box from the butte. As the covered wagon stops, third picture, top row, Beetle exclaims that he was tricked by Cube Root. Michaels is furious. Last picture, top row, he climbs out of the wagon, ordering Roy to follow. And he says, Now, Jut, you and Ballas keep your guns on Rogers from inside the wagon. If he tries to warn Root up above, grill him. First picture, bottom row, when Cube sees Roy and Michaels down below, he immediately lowers the box of gold, thinking the outlaws are captured. Michaels tells Roy, next picture, all right, grab the box, Rogers. And no funny stuff. Remember, my men have you covered from the wagon. Roy answers, your scheme won't work, Michaels. Hey, somebody's coming. 
They look up and see a lovely girl on horseback who gallops up to them. She reins in third picture bottom row and tells them that she's Sally Norton, that her father owns the stage line and that she's been sent out to find why it's so late getting back to Prescott. Roy warns her, get back, lady. Michael says nervously, quiet, Rogers. Now, don't mind this road agent, Miss Norton. Your stage drivers are in the wagon yonder. Uh, we're wounded. Suddenly, last picture, Roy grabs Michael, who has his back to him, saying, It's a trick. Get behind me, ma'am. Quick. Held firmly in Roy's grasp, Michael's faces Ballast and Jutt, who stand there, guns in hand. Michael's whines, Now, Jutt, Ballast, don't shoot. Don't shoot. You might hit me. Jutt says coldly, Too bad, banker Michaels. But that'll mean one less split in the goal. Let him have it, Ballast. But if they shoot the banker, Michaels, the bullet might go right through him and kill Roy. Yes, there's always that possibility. And look, Roy's gun is gone. They took it away from him, remember? Yes, he's really in a tough spot again. Oh, and I know. We'll have to wait on next week to find out what's going to happen. Yes, I'm afraid we will. But you don't have to wait for Alice in Wonderland. Oh, goody. I just love Alice in Wonderland. Quick, quick, where is she? Turn over the page, and there she is, on page three of the second section. Oh, yes, and do you remember what happened? Alice followed the little rabbit through the hole in the tree, and she fell down, down, down into a room. Yes, and, and the rabbit skittered through a tiny door in the room. And Alice was too big to go through. So first she drank something out of a bottle, and she became so small that she could go through the door. But she couldn't reach the key then because it was up on top of the table. And then the doorknob told her to eat a little cookie that was in a box to make her grow big again. So Alice took a bite. It's a quick read. I want to see if she gets big enough to get the key. Very well. Here we go with Alice in Wonderland. Say the magic words with me. And, and now, now for a story, story that, that gets curiouser and curiouser. And curiouser. Alice, Alice in, in Wonderland. Wonderland. So, so music, music, sir. Music, music sir. sir. The Eat Me Cookie magically makes Alice grow. Up and up she rises till her head bumps against the ceiling of the chamber. And now she's so big she fills the room. The doorknob laughs second picture. <laughs> a little of that cookie went a long way. <laughs> Suddenly, Alice begins to cry. Oh, dear. And, of oh, course, dear. she's so huge now that her tears fall like a waterfall. And the tears begin to cover the floor. And the doorknob says, Oh, I say now, uh, this won't do at all. Uh, the bottle, quick, before you drown me with your tears. Quickly, Alice reaches down, picks up the bottle, which is floating, and takes a big, big gulp. And suddenly, she begins to shrink again. She becomes so tiny that she thinks she'll drown in the pool of tears. So to save herself from drowning, she climbs in the bottle. And last picture top row, she begins to float away in a sea of tears. And she calls... Please, please help me. She floats for a while, and then a wave tumbles her upon a beach. In the first picture bottom row, a strange parade is going on. She sees a dodo bird on top of a little hummock who says... I'm enjoying the chase. Nothing could be drier than a jolly caucus race. Fascinated, Alice watches the dodo and the caucus race. Next picture. Round and around and backward and forward, the funny little sea things go. As the dodo bird says, Forward, backward, inward, outward, up, and join the chase. Then suddenly the white rabbit appears again. And then away he runs. Alice runs after him, third picture bottom row calling. Oh, oh, Mr. Rabbit. And the white rabbit answers, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. Alice chases after him, over the hill, down the valley, and into the forest, where he disappears. Last picture, Alice looks through an avenue of trees and exclaims, Oh, now where did he go? While unknown to Alice, two odd little men who are exactly alike are watching her as she searches for the white rabbit. <laughs> Love this. This is so wonderful. The most interesting and exciting things happen to Alice. Yes, imagine shrinking so small she could use a bottle for a boat. Isn't that unusual? <laughs> yes. And isn't that dodo bird funny? I should say so. I wonder who those little men are. Well, next week you're going to find out about that. Oh, goody. I certainly won't miss that. Fine. Now let's turn over the page. And here on the top of page four is Dick's Adventures. Oh, yes. And Dick always has wonderful dreams about the early days of America. Such interesting and true things about our country. I wonder what it's going to be today. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. <laughs> riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick. 
On a blustery December day, 1799, Dick finds himself on Washington's plantation at Mount Vernon, riding beside the general. With an uneasy premonition of trouble, he glances at the general, now in his late 60s, and he says, first picture, You look tired, sir. There is trouble, for as they rein up before the general's house, he sways in the saddle. Dick quickly calls, Hey, help somebody, help, help. Servants run to help, last picture top row for the general, that giant of strength is stricken. A short time later, first picture, second row, the saddened household learns from the doctor that only a few hours remain to a great man. The household is hushed as Dick stands with bowed head, and a soldier joins the ranks of his beloved countrymen who have gone before him through the years of hardship and struggle. A shocked nation learns the news. Last picture, second row, both houses of Congress meet. And Dick sees General Lighthorse Harry Lee, father of Robert E. Lee, rise to speak a last tribute. He hears spoken for the first time the memorable words that Washington was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. But America is not alone in her bereavement. In France, first picture bottom row, a former corporal stands silent. The heart of Napoleon, France's greatest general, becomes heavy with the news that the great American general has passed away. And next picture, Great England dips her flag to honor the old fox who outwitted her. And then the years roll forward, and Dick is mumbling, First in war, first in peace, and... In that last picture, he sits up. He looks around and sees that he's in his own room in the year 1951. And Dick exclaims, Oh, gee, I've been dreaming. Oh, everybody loved George Washington, didn't they? Yes, everybody was sad when he died. Well, I should think they would be when you think of all the things he did for this country. Yes. It just makes me sad now to think about it. Well, next week, maybe we'll have another interesting story about the early days of America. Oh, goody, because I just love them. So do I. Oh, look, there's Rusty Riley right underneath Dick's adventures. And you remember last week, Tex and Rusty discovered the little girl Queenie's father was not to blame for that accident that happened in the horse race. No, and Rusty has learned that the owner of Grassy Acres, Mr. Crumb, had hired a crook to cause the accident. And in that accident, the wrong driver, a man named Corny Botts, was crippled for life. And Tex and Rusty have told Corny Botts, who works at Grassy Acres Farm, what they've learned. Oh, and is he mad? Corny Botts believed Rusty. And I want to see if he's going to help Rusty and Tex to show up those crooks over there at Grassy Acres. Well, let's read now and find out. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Tex says to Corny, first picture, Hey, considering what Rusty overheard, there ain't much doubt in my mind that Nick done the sabotaging on your silky, thinking, of course, that it was Kendall's. Corny replies, Yeah, and under Crumb's orders, just let me get to him. He was supposed to be so big-hearted, giving me a job at Grassy Acres. I'll fix him. Oh, whoa, 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 then now, take it easy, Corny. He'd just deny it. You'd be fired. But if you'll help us, we'll get proof. Yeah, I guess wouldn't get me nowhere to blow my top. Well, how can I help, Tex? Tex goes on, last picture, top row. Well, for the time being, Corny, maybe the best thing you can do is to spread the word around Grassy Acres that Milestone Farm is out to beat them at the county fair. Meanwhile, Rusty will get in a lot of practice. I don't see quite what you got in your mind, but, well, if it'll help put Crumb where he belongs, I'll do it. Lad's a natural driver, Tex. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, Rusty goes out to the pasture where he finds Queenie with the famous trotting horse she and Rusty had saved from being sold. Rusty says, Oh, hiya, Queenie. Oh, boy, have I got news. Come on with me and I'll tell you. Tex is hatching some kind of a plan. He wants me to take Snowflake to the blacksmith shop. That means he's going to put racing plates on her. Queenie is surprised that Tex is going to put Snowflake in a race. She says she thought they'd have to have a sulky, which is a little racing cart to hitch onto the horse. Rusty says, well, Tex has got that fixed, too. Old Sam, who works at the Lexington Trotters track, is going to lend us one. And Rusty takes Snowflake by the halter and leads her to the barn. (laughs) 
A little later, Rusty finds Tex in the yard, working on a racing sulky, and he says, third picture, bottom row, but gee, Willikins, the sulky's here. Tex replies, yep, you're gonna put in a lot of time with it, Rusty. You don't know it yet, but you're gonna ride this here chariot at the county fair. Meanwhile, at Grassy Acres Farm, Corny Botts, who has returned, has gone into Mr. Crumb's office, and last picture is saying, Hey, boss, did you know Milestone's going in for trotters? They're saying they're going to make your entry look sick at the county fair. Mr. Crumb leans back in his chair, puffs on his cigar, and grins. Oh, yeah? Well, they must still be leaving Santa Claus if they think I'm going to let any horse beat Poob off. Tex wants Rusty to ride in a race against the Grassy Acres horse. He must have some scheme in mind by which he hopes he can trick Mr. Crumb. But I wonder what it is. I'm sure I don't know, but that's something that Tex isn't going to tell us until next week. Well, I wish he'd tell me now. Oh, he won't, though. You'll be here next week, and we'll find out a lot more interesting things about the comics. And there'll be another exciting chapter of Alice in Wonderland. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tony Gleagly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's the date, and the date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.